Welcome back to another Space News Weekly Roundup. Lots of juicy stories to cover again this week, from two Starlink missions, loads of progress with SpaceX's Starship, Blue Origin construction, and we saw lots of cool launches, including a groundbreaking hop test, a record-smashing flight from Firefly Aerospace, and Expedition 70 to the International Space Station, where astronauts have made a significant breakthrough with bioprinting, and one crew member just broke a major spaceflight record. All of this and so much more, let's dive right in. We left things last week with Booster 10 being wheeled out of the Mega Bay on a transporter, being taken down to the Macy's site for what we assumed would be structural testing, for a couple of reasons. Firstly, Booster 10 has already undergone propellant load testing, and secondly, it was rolled out on top of the thrust simulator stand, which is used for structural tests of vehicles. However, a couple of days after arriving at Macy's, we saw cryo testing, with the booster's upper liquid methane tank being filled. However, on Friday, we saw the thrust simulator put to use. Now, the thrust simulator is different to the other structural test device that we see used at Starbase, the can crusher. The can crusher sandwiches vehicles between two plates that are then pulled together. The thrust simulator stand instead uses hydraulic rams that simulate the forces produced by the Raptor engines. I'm just clearing that up because a couple of comments on my last video got the two mixed up, so I thought I'd just clarify that one. Anyway, after the test was complete, we then saw another Booster 10 cryo test, this time focusing on the liquid oxygen tank. It's a bit hard to see there because of the lighting, but I promise there's definitely frosting there. Thursday marked what was probably the most significant Starship event of the week. At the launch site, where Booster 9 and Ship 25 were patiently waiting for launch, the ship quick disconnect arm was retracted, and then the chopsticks were used to de-stack Ship 25. Now, this isn't a bad sign, in fact, it's a good mark of progress. There was always going to be at least one more de-stack before launch, because Ship 25's flight termination system is not currently installed. This is only done just prior to launch. So hopefully, things are moving closer to final stack and launch now. What is the latest on when to expect the next Starship Orbital launch? Well, on Wednesday last week, acting head of the Federal Aviation Administration, Polly Trottenberg, indicated that they're potentially going to grant SpaceX a launch license next month, so October. In addition to obtaining a FAA launch license, she also stated that SpaceX will correspondingly need to obtain a separate environmental approval from the US Fish and Wildlife Service, though she didn't mention a specific timeline for this. In order to gain the launch license, SpaceX needed to implement 63 corrective actions, though Elon purported that only 57 of these are actually required for the second launch, with the remaining six being for future launches. Trottenberg mentioned that the FAA's collaboration with SpaceX has been positive, and she expressed optimism about next month. Here's hoping that October timeline holds true then. If Elon is to be believed, then the FAA should now be satisfied that all needed corrective actions have been undertaken. And of course, they recently completed their investigation into the April test launch. We don't really know much about the stance of the US Fish and Wildlife Service, but given that the environmental impact that Launch 2 will have will be essentially identical to the impact from Launch 1, I'm optimistic that there shouldn't be any hurdles with this one. One positive indication that a launch should be coming very soon is that on Tuesday, a huge number of SpaceX employees assembled next to the Ship 25 and Booster 9 full stack for a photo opportunity. We saw continued work on Ship 20's heat shield tiling. Now, we've still not had any concrete information about why SpaceX are seemingly preparing this vehicle for launch. My guess, and I think most people's guesses, is that this is going to be put on display along with its first stage, Booster 4. Whereabouts it'll be displayed though, we're still not sure on that one, possibly either at Starbase itself or Brownsville Airport, unless you have any ideas. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. And of course, drop a thumbs up on the video as well, helps my channel not to get too killed by the algorithm and all that jazz. <laughs> With space made by the departure of Booster 10, Booster 11 was moved back into the Mega Bay on Tuesday. Lab Padre captured an excellent shot of the currently engineless underside of the vehicle. The booster was then lifted by the Mega Bay's bridge crane and placed onto Booster 10's stand. Alongside Booster 11, we saw Booster 13's liquid oxygen tank continue stacking. Another vehicle that was stacked was Ship 31, which was stacked on top of its common dome in the high bay. Our eye in the sky, Greg Scott, was once again airborne at the Kennedy Space Center last week, giving us a look at Starbase Roberts Road and the Kennedy launch sites. Starbase Roberts Road still appears to be largely stalled in any progress. There's still only seven tower segments for Starship Tower 3, and there really haven't been any new developments here. 
construction has continued though on these tower segments. This isn't Starship hardware, but instead this will form the crew access tower for Launch Complex 40, where SpaceX currently launched non-crew Dragon Falcon 9s, giving the US a second launch pad from which they can launch crewed missions. As you can see, the first tower segment has now been installed at the launch pad, and if SpaceX's pace with Starship infrastructure building is anything to go by, it won't be too long before we see this thing reach full height. It's expected that SpaceX will certify the infrastructure with Cargo Dragon missions before moving on to crewed launches, giving America its second ever human crew capable launch site. Which is good, since the only other launch pad they have for crew missions right now is this one, 39A which is where Starship will eventually launch from, and that vehicle doesn't have the best track record when it comes to not destroying launch infrastructure. <laughs> Over at Launchpad 39B, NASA has rolled out the SLS Mobile Launcher, which was damaged during last year's Artemis 1 launch. It's now back at the pad for testing, now the repairs and refurbishments are complete. I can't wait to see this thing rolled back to the vehicle assembly building, and we can start seeing the stacking of the SLS rocket for Artemis 2. The launcher will also be used for Artemis 3, but Artemis 4 will use the bigger, more capable SLS Block 1B, which requires its own launch tower. Assembly of this has begun, as seen here. Blue Origin continues its expansion of its Kennedy facilities. Launch Complex 36 saw preparations in full swing for testing and the inaugural launch of New Glenn. You can see a small transporter erector positioned on the pad for fitting tests. Over at the Rocket Factory, construction of a couple of notable structures seems to have concluded following the last flyover of the site. The Reef Pathfinder building and the Vertical Assembly building are largely complete, externally at least. Curiously, the Vertical Assembly Building only has one very short door, so it's unclear how vehicle stacks are going to be transported in and out of this structure. That being said, the walls themselves look more like temporary sheeting rather than solid cladding, and there's an outline of what might be a full height door on the other side, so it'll be interesting to see how this building looks on Greg's next flyover. Now, do you remember Starhopper and SN5 and SN6? I miss the days of flying grain silos too. And I guess so did Stoke Space, because last week they performed their very own SpaceX-style hop test. The hopper test vehicle reached 9 meters in altitude, landing safely in its designated zone after a brief 15-second flight. This test validated Stoke's novel hydrogen and oxygen engine, regenerative heat shield, and thrust control using differential throttling. It also affirmed the reliability of Stokes avionics software and ground systems. This is a prototype of the upper stage of their rocket, which is planned to be fully reusable with an eventual 24-hour turnaround time. Think of it more like a fully reusable Falcon 9 rather than a Starship-like vehicle. The upper stage has an engine that's a bit like an aero spike. It's a single engine with a ring of 30 nozzles, which surround the stage's actively cooled heat shield. It'll re-enter like a traditional capsule rather than a belly flop style re-entry like Starship and like Terran R was going to and how presumably Blue Origin's Project Jarvis will re-enter. If you want to learn more about Stoke Space's rocket, then Everyday Astronaut has a great video on it, link in the description. Getting the second stage to be reusable is going to be a significant challenge, so huge congratulations to Stoke Space on this successful test. The International Space Station welcomed three new crew members this week. On Friday, NASA astronaut Laurel O'Hara, Andros Cosmos cosmonaut Oleg Kononenko, and Nikolai Chubb launched from the Baikonur Cosmodrome on Friday aboard the Soyuz MS-24 spacecraft. After a three hour long journey to the station, they docked successfully and after about two hours, the spacecraft's hatch was opened and the arrival of the three crew members brought the total number of occupants on the station to 10. Among them is Frank Rubio, who just broke a record. In March last year, NASA astronaut Mark Van Dyke completed a 355 day mission aboard the station, the longest space flight by an American. But now the torch has been passed, as last Monday, Frank Rubio passed 355 days and is set to return on the 27th of this month, totaling 371 days in space. Mark gave Frank a call to congratulate his milestone from Mission Control in Houston. In other station news, astronauts have successfully 3D bioprinted the first human knee meniscus using the station's biofabrication facility. 
The biofabrication facility is being used to experiment the 3D printing of knee cartilage using bioinks and cells, and the successful bioprinting of knee meniscus marks a big step towards creating solutions for those recovering from musculoskeletal injuries. In time, the biofabrication facility could expand into commercial use, with the station fabricating tissues and organs for transplant back on Earth. An exciting space story to look out for in the coming days is the return of Osiris Rex. The spacecraft recently made a small course adjustment to realign itself ready to release the sample return capsule, which contains material from asteroid Bennu, towards the landing zone in the Utah desert. The capsule's parachute landing is expected on Sunday and will mark the completion of the United States' first asteroid sample return mission. Last week in space launches, we saw two Starlink missions streamed on X by SpaceX. The first was Starlink Group 7-2, which launched from Vandenberg on Tuesday, carrying 21 Starlink V2 minis to orbit. The first stage made a successful landing on the Of Course I Still Love You drone ship, wrapping up this booster's 11th overall flight. The other Starlink launch was another batch of V2 minis on Starlink Group 6-16, launched from Cape Canaveral Launch Complex 40 on Saturday. The first stage booster landed on the Just Read the Instructions drone ship, completing its fifth overall flight. Firefly Aerospace made a significant achievement last week. They successfully launched their third ever Firefly Alpha rocket for the US Space Force with just 24 hours notice as a demonstration of rapid launch capabilities for the United States for national security missions. The previous record was set by Northrop Grumman in 2021, who launched a payload in 21 days, a record suitably obliterated by Firefly during this mission. In the demonstration, the US Space Force gave notice to Firefly, giving them the target orbit required, and then teams got to work updating flight software trajectories and preparing the rocket for launch. And meanwhile, Millennium Space Systems began their own challenge, transporting the payload 165 miles from California to the Vandenberg Space Force Base for integration with the rocket's payload adapter. Unfortunately, there wasn't a live stream of the launch, but Firefly did put out a video highlighting the mission's success, as well as a clip of the satellite's deployment. A resounding success for both Firefly and Space Force, enhancing the United States' capability to rapidly respond to on-orbit needs during a conflict or in response to a national security threat. The final orbital launch of the week came from China. This was a Long March 2D, which launched on Sunday from the Zichang Launch Center, carrying three Yaogan 39 satellites to low Earth orbit. The Yaogan series of satellites are remote sensing military reconnaissance satellites, and all three are now in orbit and operational. I had a bit of a hiccup at Laon Aerospace last week. I had plans to get two KSP2 videos out on Wednesday and Saturday, but there were some unforeseen delays with the Saturday video, so that had to be pushed back to this week. I did, however, manage to get Wednesdays up okay. In this video, I broke down an hour-long Q&A with senior KSP2 dev Chris Adderley, as well as some written follow-up answers into a nice digestible summary of what the KSP2 development team are working on right now. If that sounds good to you, then hopefully it's one of the video cards on screen. And while we're addressing what's on screen, big thanks to the names on the left, my Patreon and YouTube member supporters who make all of this content possible. But anyway, that's the end of the video. I hope this was a fun old episode of Space This Week. What was your favourite launch? Let me know in the comments down below, like all three of you that are probably still watching at this point. I'll see you next one. Bye, everyone. <laughs>